Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Swartz, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. For over seven decades, this council has brought our community fresh, nonpartisan civil discourse on the critical issues affecting our world. And tonight's program on Iran is no different. And with the Iranian, Iranian elections taking place on June 18th, less than a month from now, and the fourth round of indirect talks in Vienna having concluded just last week, the future of foreign relations between the US and Iran is top of mind for many. We plan to dive into the challenges in tonight's discussion with our expert panelists and hopefully learn about what the future might hold for this nuclear deal. I'd like to take a moment to thank our partner, the Iran Project, particularly Katya Mead for helping arrange tonight's program. And with the end of another challenging school year, I'd like to offer a special welcome to the high school students, college students, and teachers who participate in our education programs throughout the year. We work with over 2,500 youth across 85 schools annually to give them access to world affairs. We've continued to work with them virtually, offering things like a model junior United Nations, even this week, and debate programs. And these students are really eager to solve the world's most complex problems. So we're pleased to share tonight's program with people of all ages, backgrounds, political viewpoints, and perspectives. If you'd like to send us questions for our panelists to answer later on in our program, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom platform, and we will be able to accommodate questions at the end of our moderated discussion. Now I'd like to introduce our guest panelists for tonight. Kelsey Davenport is the director of, for the Non-Proliferation Policy at the Arms Control Association, where she focuses on the nuclear and missile programs in Iran, North Korea, India, and Pakistan, and on international efforts to prevent proliferation and nuclear terrorism. She also reports on developments in these areas for arms control today and runs the Arms Control Association's project assessing the effectiveness of multilateral voluntary initiatives that contribute to non-proliferation efforts. Prior to joining the Arms Control Association, Kelsey worked with a think tank in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem researching Middle East security issues. And step, we've got Estep, excuse me, Estander batman gelit is a visiting fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and the founder and publisher of Force and Bazaar, a media company that supports business diplomacy between Europe and Iran through publishing, research, and events. Aside from his contributions to Boris and Bazaar's own platform, Yar's writing on Iranian business and politics has been published in Foreign Policy, Al Monitor, Course, Defense One, and Low Blog, as well as the Iranian political periodicals Iran, Hamshari, and Diplomat. His scholarship on Iranian political economy has been published in the Encyclopedia Iranica and the journal Iranian Studies. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass the virtual microphone to each of you to make a few minutes of opening remarks, and then we'll turn to our discussion, followed by audience Q&A. Kelsey, could we start with you, please? Thank you so much, Lauren, for inviting me to be here today and to the World Council um, on Philadelphia for hosting this event. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm going to just start my opening remarks uh, by making three main points that I, we can build upon in the question and answer. You know, first, so much of the discussion about Iran right now and the nuclear deal with Iran has centered around undoing U.S. violations, you know, undoing Iranian violations and Iran's activities in the region. So I think it's important to emphasize, number one, that the nuclear deal with Iran worked. You know, from January of 2016, you know, until May of 2019, Iran abided by its commitments under the deal. And we saw significant non-proliferation benefits from Iran abiding by those commitments. The limitations on Iran's nuclear program and the more intrusive monitoring regime essentially assured the international community that Iran was not pursuing nuclear weapons and, and that if Iran ever made the decision to do so, the international community would have enough time to respond, you know, if Iran chose to violate the deal. So again, you know, for more than three years, the deal worked. U.S. intelligence confirmed that Iran was abiding by its commitments and confirmed the benefits of the deal. 
So the second point that I want to make is closely tied to that first point, and that's that we can restore these nonproliferation benefits in the nuclear deal, you know, if we can bring the United States and Iran back into compliance with the agreement, you know, relatively quickly. If we look at the violations that Iran has conducted, you know, since May of 2019, these were initially responsive to the US decision to withdraw from the deal and reimpose sanctions on Iran. Essentially, after receiving no benefit from the sanctions envisioned by the deal, Iran responded by breaching the nuclear limits uh, and reducing some of the transparency measures put in place by the accord. Uh, then later, after the assassination of Iranian scientist Moshan Fakhrizadeh, and then an attack on one of Iran's main enrichment facilities in February, Iran took further steps to violate the deal. So what this tells us is that Iran's violations are really about leverage. They're about pushing the parties to the deal to deliver on sanctions relief and pushing the United States to return to the deal. Uh, this isn't about an Iranian attempt to dash for a bomb. This is an indicative of Iran making the decision to pursue the bomb. So if we look at these violations again from a nonproliferation perspective, you know, restoring the deal, uh, rolling back these violations, you know, will bring the United States and the international community significant nonproliferation benefits again. So there's space to restore the deal, to restore those benefits, uh, but the parties have to act quickly because if Iran does continue to violate the deal, does continue to ratchet up its activities, it will become more and more difficult to restore those benefits. And finally, you know, the third point that I want to make to, to kick off this discussion is that, you know, full implementation of the nuclear deal, you know, by the United States and Iran really sets up opportunities for further negotiations on a wide range of issues, uh, not only on the nuclear issue, but also to address, you know, regional security concerns. And I think it does this for two reasons. You know, first, you know, if we look back to, you know, the Trump administration's decision to withdraw from the deal in 2018, you know, Trump did this despite the US intelligence community acknowledging Iran's compliance. So the United States, you know, was dealt a serious credibility blow by withdrawing from this deal and reimposing sanctions that are, uh, while our allies supported the deal and while Iran was abiding by the deal. So returning to it kind of helps, you know, restore some of that credibility that the United States has lost. You know, and second, you know, returning to the deal really creates the necessary time and space for the United States to engage with Iran on negotiations on a wider range of issues. You know, right now, if we look at Iran's nuclear program, it's breaches of the deal. You know, in total, you know, if Iran were to make the decision to pursue nuclear weapons, you know, it could move along that path kind of fairly quickly. So restoring the JCPOA and restoring those limits on Iran's nuclear program, the more intrusive monitoring uh, arrests that nuclear crisis and essentially ensures that there's no, you know, Iranian nuclear threat kind of hanging over the entire region. That creates time for the Biden administration to pursue a follow-on agreement that builds on the 2015 nuclear deal that addresses some of Iran's um, nuclear activities after limits in the deal began to expire. Um, so again, you know, those are the, just the three points that I wanted to start with, that the JCPOA worked, it proved to be effective, uh, that the JCPOA can be effective again if the United States and Iran, you know, restore compliance with it quickly, and that restoring the nuclear deal really sets the table for the United States to engage in a wider range of talks in Iran, you know, on nuclear activities that extend beyond the deal's limitations, you know, and on regional security issues. So hopefully, you know, we'll see some more progress coming out of this latest talks in Vienna, and then we can really start to think about what building on the JCPOA looks like. Uh, so I'll stop there and I'll look forward to your questions and further discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelsey. You, you packed a lot into those first three points and I see Yar nodding and, and taking notes as, as well as myself. Yar, opening remarks from you, please. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Um, it's always a pleasure uh, to participate in these World Affairs Council events. So. Um, I think Kelsey has laid out kind of the case for the JCPOA brilliantly, and I think we are fortunate that the Biden administration is looking at this opportunity with that kind of strategic logic. Um, I'm going to sort of use my opening remarks to talk a little bit about why, despite the fact that the case for the JCPOA in Washington is so strong, and why, despite the fact that the administration has now really shown its commitment to engaging in these uh, talks currently underway with Iran, there is still a degree of anxiety um, from uh, leadership in Tehran about the future of the nuclear deal. 
And that anxiety stems from the notion that the negotiations that are currently underway, as dif difficult as they were to start and as uh, challenging as they are no doubt for the uh, teams that are meeting in Vienna, they are in some respects the easy part. So we are fortunate to have US and Iranian negotiating teams that are essentially the same as those teams that uh, brought the nuclear deal together uh, in 2014 and 2015. And we are also fortunate that they are negotiating a, a deal that already exists and the terms are quite clear. But the challenge will come from this idea of restoring the benefits of the deal. And as Kelsey laid out from an arms control standpoint, that is going to be very achievable uh, with the US re-entering the JCPOA. But the challenge from the Iranian perspective is that their benefits in the agreement, so the quid pro quo that they are really looking to restore, which stem from the sanctions relief that the US uh, will need to deliver as part of its re-entry into the nuclear deal, is actually going to be harder to deliver than it was in 2016. And this stems from uh, basically problems around the implementation of sanctions relief and a long shadow that's gonna be cast by the decision of the Trump administration to reimpose sanctions in 2018. In sort of brief terms, the problem is that it is difficult to convince companies and banks that uh, the Iranians are hoping will want to re-engage with their economy, that any new agreement is going to be durable given the experience of the last few years where an agreement that Iran was uh, abiding by, and as Kelsey uh, mentioned, that the even the intelligence community of the United States uh, assured uh, that Iran was abiding by was still uh, sort of abrogated by the US with secondary sanctions reimposed. And a lot of companies that had undertaken efforts to enter the Iranian market uh, as part of plans to establish factories, invest in infrastructure, grow their trade relationships, uh, were burned by that experience. And so they're going to be hesitant to kind of dive back in uh, until we see if this agreement is durable. And so the economic uplift that is likely to follow U.S. re-entry into the JCPOA is probably going to be less than what the Iranians would really have hoped for. This also has a bearing on the other thing that Kelsey talked about, which is how you build on this agreement for uh, Iran and the U.S. to reach uh, broader understandings on other issues where there are disagreements. So, for example, on issues of regional security, or on issues related to, uh, for example, Iran's ballistic missile program. The credibility problem that emerges uh, uh, from the fact that the US uh, withdrew from the agreement despite Iranian compliance is compounded as well from the, a credibility problem of what happens when uh, it becomes clear that US promises to lift sanctions don't necessarily lead to the kind of economic benefits that the stakeholders uh, might ideally want to see. And so if you're hoping that there's going to be a more for more deal, um, the US, I think, will need to prepare to actually really commit uh, to making sure that it is seen as a, a counterparty that can make good on its commitments in order to get to a point where it can open those negotiations with uh, Iran on these other issues. Now, the good news is that we have a political opportunity here. This is going to be the first time in a long time after the Iranian elections that you have a first term president in the US and a first term president in Iran. And that means you have two figures that have an incentive to actually build, uh, looking to the fact that they are both likely to have a second term, uh, build on a sort of long term horizon about uh, getting the diplomatic relationship into a more productive place. But you know, again, that more for more deal depends on the US really trying to tackle the credibility problem, including from uh, the standpoint of uh, concerns over whether or not it's possible to actually lift sanctions um, effectively. So I'll sort of leave it at that. I mean, I remain very optimistic and I think we're, we're very fortunate that the negotiations in Vienna appear to be going well. But I think my sort of word of caution is that this is the, um, uh, we're still really at the starting point of this process, uh, and that even if the U.S. re-enters the JCPOA, there's a lot of problem solving that will need to be done to make sure that the deal uh, remains durable and that it can be built upon. And the one thing that we should really be looking at 
is whether or not the economic benefits of the deal materialize um, with the speed and certainty that we know the non-proliferation benefits uh, will materialize the way that Kelsey laid out. Thank you, Yar. You, you both started with a bit more optimism than I think some of our audience might have expected in a program on such a complex and, and weighty and timely topic. So uh, let's dive in a little bit more. And there is so much activity going on right now. Right now, it's a bit fortuitous that we have both of you experts here with us in this moment. As the fourth round of indirect talks between the U.S. and Iran concluded just last week, right? And the Joint Commission is hopeful that a fifth round starting this week will be final. It's hard to even say that word and feel like it might have stickiness to it. But with Britain, France, Germany, China, and Russia all playing parts in the talks and shuttling between the U.S. and Iran, can you help us understand a little bit more in detail? Where has this left us? How have these various actors who all have their own relationships with Iran and the U.S. and amongst each other, how have they contributed to these discussions? And then what do, what do you hope for? What can we hope for for this next and possibly final round? Yara, let's start with you, please. Sure. So, you know, I think uh, we're fortunate that other countries really stepped up to try and keep this uh, deal on life support over the last three years after the U.S. withdrew. Um, and that includes Russia and China, interestingly enough. So there was a real sort of multilateral effort uh, to, to uh, keep Iran in the nuclear deal. Uh, this took a few different forms. So from the European standpoint, um, our allies in Europe uh, made an effort to try and uh, promise the Iranians that they would keep the economic engagement going despite the fact that the US um, reimposed sanctions. Uh, that did not work entirely as planned. One of the lessons that we learned here is that the U.S. Uh, has really a, a, an enormous amount of power in the global financial system through its sanctions. And if, if the U.S. Uh, imposes sanctions even unilaterally, that's enough to stymie most trade and investment that uh, countries in Europe or in, uh, other countries around the world might want to do with um, uh, a country like Iran. Nonetheless, you know, the Europeans said the right things, they maintained their economic, their sort of diplomatic engagement with Iran, and it gave the Iranians some sort of something to sort of cling on to with regards to the, the sort of West's commitment to the nuclear deal. In parallel, you know, we often talk about Russia and China as sort of spoilers of um, global diplomacy, but uh, because they're very much interested in avoiding uh, a further degeneration of the security environment in the Middle East, um, particularly China, which is a major importer of energy supplies from the Middle East, uh, they likewise uh, put a significant degree of pressure on Iran um, as part of their bilateral diplomatic exchanges to tell the Iranians, look, we know this is unfair. Um, we're going to try and stand by you as much as we can. Their economic commitments to Iran um, were underwhelming in the period. Nonetheless, the political messaging was enough so that, again, the Iranians could sort of demonstrate some patience, stick with the deal, and uh, hope for what ended up happening, which is that there was a change in the administration in Washington and an opportunity to kind of um, restore the agreement. So, you know, in, this is a good example of how a multilateral agreement was kept alive, um, even though the U.S. withdrew and, and really tried to kill the deal. Um, but, you know, that was, it wasn't a, um, it couldn't have lasted that way much longer. So we're lucky that, you know, we got to the point where the Biden administration was able to make this a priority in the first few months of uh, their um, time in office. And, you know, uh, the deal is sort of coming off life support if the U.S. re-enters. That's a nice thought. That some multilateral diplomacy was working in the background throughout the pandemic and the major political shifts around the world to deliver us where we are right now. Kelsey, reaction from you. Well, I agree largely with what you know, Yar has said, and I think his emphasis on the important role that Russia and China have played in this process is often overlooked. 
I mean, looking at what's happened over the past few years on the nuclear side, you know, we saw Russia and China continue to engage on critical nonproliferation projects with Iran that continued to reduce the possible future weapons related threat, you know, from their nuclear program. China has been very involved in converting a reactor that could have been used to produce plutonium. You know, Russia was working with Iran on converting a key facility so that it'd be focused on research. Um, so again, you know, I just highlight this because, you know, the international community really came together prior to negotiations on the nuclear deal to support a robust sanctions regime targeting Iran, because there was, you know, a general acknowledgement that a nuclear armed Iran, you know, was in no one's best interest. Uh, and so I think, again, you know, we're seeing that same level of international support, trying to restore the deal uh, and, and bring it back together, again, because of that recognition that a nuclear armed Iran or the threat of a nuclear armed Iran, you know, is destabilizing not only for the region, but for the broader nonproliferation regime. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that I'm optimistic that we'll see, you know, this agreement to restore the deal, you know, come together, uh, even though I think it's, it's going to be slow, you know, I'm not as optimistic as some who think it could be wrapped up this week, I think we have a few more weeks of negotiations. Uh, because, you know, having followed this issue closely during the negotiations on the original deal, you know, I, I know it's true when they say that, you know, nothing is resolved until everything is resolved, but um, I'm still optimistic going forward. Appreciate that optimism, right? So, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the Biden administration's position with, with regard to these sanctions. They're in a delicate spot, right? Leaving the sanctions in place, on one hand, puts the future of the deal at risk. On the other hand, withdrawing sanctions uh, could position Biden as being weak on terrorism, validating some of his critics and upsetting partners who are against the removal of sanctions. And then, of course, there's Congress to deal with as well. What do you think the best path forward is for the Biden administration? Is there a middle ground? And particularly as we walk through these perhaps next round of negotiation or a few more weeks, as you suggest, Kelsey, let's start with you. Well, I'm hesitant to weigh in on sanctions when Yar is uh, the event because he's far more of an expert than I am. Fair um, but I, I, you know, I, I think you, you know, you raised a good point that you know when the Trump administration, you know, reimposed sanctions on Iran beginning in May of. Uh, 2018, uh, they then followed that up with, you know, an array of sanctions on non-nuclear issues. And some of those sanctions, you know, would prevent Iran from receiving some of the sanctions relief envisioned, you know, under the nuclear deal. So I think kind of threading that line of, you know, what should be lifted and, and you know, what might need to be, what might need to remain in place is, you know, certainly causing, you know, a significant discussion, you know, and, and disagreement, you know, in, in these negotiations. Um, and I'll, I'll, Yara will probably be able to speak to that in more detail. Um, but your question about Congress, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, there are members of Congress who would oppose restoring the nuclear deal, even if these sanctions, you know, weren't involved, uh, because they oppose the nuclear deal, you know, from, from the onset. Uh, so I think, you know, we'll see some of these members, you know, perhaps use these terrorism related sanctions, you know, as an excuse to continue their opposition. You know, that being said, though, you know, the nuclear deal does allow the United States to impose, you know, non-nuclear sanctions, uh, you know, in line, you know, with its own laws. So I would say, you know, going forward, the Biden administration should make clear and continue to make clear to Iran uh, that it will pursue those sanctions, you know, for terrorism and other related activities, you know, in line with what the JCPOA requires. Uh, and I think that should demonstrate that the United States can both support the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, but also respond to Iranian actions that are counter to U.S. interests. Yeah. I think the main thing to emphasize here is that, you know, obviously we're talking about lifting sanctions, but the vast majority of U.S. sanctions on Iran will remain in place. Um, so all primary sanctions, which are the sanctions that uh, essentially prevent any U.S. person or financial institution from transacting with Iran, uh, will remain untouched, even if uh, the uh, U.S. reenters the nuclear deal. So, you know, I think it's important to emphasize this because people often make the assumption that what we're basically offering Iran is a total unencumbered access to the global economy. But it is difficult for me to express exactly how uh, challenging it is for companies 
uh, to work in Iran in very uncontroversial areas of work like um, selling consumer goods uh, like household products or pharmaceutical products to Iran in a situation where um, the secondary sanctions have been lifted. So to give you a little bit of context and to make it concrete, um, let's say in four weeks time, the US re-enters the nuclear deal and lifts all of those uh, sanctions that are inconsistent with the, the agreement as uh, Kelsey sort of described. It will still be essentially impossible for a European company to make a, uh, to receive a payment at a bank in Europe from an Iranian company for selling some non-sanctions good to an Iranian importer. Um, because there are essentially no banks in Europe aside from around 10 small financial institutions that are currently willing to do direct banking transactions with the Iranian financial system. And that will not change significantly in the immediate aftermath of the US re-entering the nuclear deal. So the, this, this sort of debate that we're having about Biden looking soft is really an invention of opponents of the nuclear deal in Washington. Uh, in reality, he is giving up a, a very small sort of degree of the overall US economic pressure on Iran in exchange for a commensurate uh, commitment from Iran with regards to its nuclear program. And so for both sides, uh, there is an incentive to go for a more for more agreement. If Iran really wants full and unencumbered access to the global economy, they're going to have to have a more uh, a deeper negotiation with the US, uh, one that will probably take into, into account a wider range of issues um, that are of concern for uh, this administration as they have been for previous administrations. So, you know, it's it's a I think it's a, a, a fact that gets lost in the debate over what Biden is trying to do. But um, he is not about to uh, open the floodgates for Iran. There's not going to be a bonanza. Uh, this is a long and bumpy road for anyone that wants to work with Iran economically. And the types of sanctions relief that we're talking about are relatively um, sort of minimal in their scope. And this is part of the anxiety that the Iranians feel. They're not actually getting as much as some in Washington might have you believe uh, that Biden is offering. Let's, let's build on that and the perceptions of Washington and the durability and stickiness of this potential agreement and its impact. We've got two questions from the audience that I'd like to address now. Uh, they're tied to this uh, about the American Congress and, and how durable is a deal. So uh, Roy asks us, in order to have a true Iranian nuclear deal, don't we need legislation approving it? If a deal could be broken simply by a president who doesn't agree with it, then there is no American commitment. Of course, expecting Congress to approve anything as controversial as this is a pipe dream, Roy writes. So are we really in a stalemate position long term? And Gerald, someone else from our audience, also adds to that. Should the president submit an agreement with Iran to the Senate for its approval? Why or why not? So circling around the same issues of what is Congress's role here? Is it impactful long term? And can presidents just shift in and out of this every few years, further making our allies as well as our enemies skeptical of trying to reach agreements with the US? Any, any takers on that, that sticky question first? I, I can jump in with a few thoughts. I think that the, those are great questions. Um, and you know, one thing I would raise is that, you know, Congress had an opportunity to weigh in on the nuclear deal in 2015. Uh, there was legislation that President Obama signed into law, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, uh, and that gave Congress, you know, the power to either vote to approve the nuclear deal, uh, vote to disapprove it, which would have prevented the president from waiving sanctions as required by the deal, you know, or, or essentially to do nothing. And, and Congress, you know, essentially decided, you know, to, to do nothing. Uh, so, you know, so I would just note that, that, that Congress had an opportunity to, to block the deal from coming into effect and, and, and they did not take it. Um, I think it is unlikely that any agreement to restore the nuclear deal uh, is going to be um, put before Congress again for that same process, because that legislation that I mentioned 
uh, it allows for subsidiary arrangements that support implementation of the nuclear deal um, to be to be brokered without um, Congress weighing in. Uh, so I think that that's unlikely. Um, looking forward, though, you know, I think the point about sustainability, you know, is really critical. And as we saw, you know, in the transition from Obama to Trump, you know, a president that supported the deal to one that opposed it. Um, you know, just what the consequences could be. And I'm sure the Iranians are looking forward to 2024, you know, not sure who's going to be in the White House and if we're going to see another reversal. Um, so what I would like to see going forward is first, you know, for the president to, to restore the JCPOA, because again, I think that resolves an immediate crisis and removes the immediacy of the nuclear threat and then creates time and space for those longer term negotiations. And I think it would be it would behoove President Biden to engage more closely with Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, about what that deal looks like in terms of building on the agreement, what that looks like on the regional security level, what that looks like on missiles, and what that looks like on building on Iran's, um, building on the nuclear restrictions in the deal. Because I think if there's greater congressional buy-in and Congress feels heard, you know, then that, that will help build that stability that will allow these agreements to last you know, from president to president. Um, you know, in an ideal world, you know, I think that that, you know, building on agreement that is broader, that perhaps gets into these primary sanctions relief, that that would be submitted, you know, to the Senate, you know, for advice and consent and, and, and ratification. And that if the Biden administration, you know, had that congressional input, uh, that we could see a successful, you know, treaty kind of come out of this process. Of course, a lot of that depends on, you know, the Iranian side and those negotiations, you um, but I think, you know, going forward that that is an option that that should be explored. Yeah, I care to comment on Congress. So I think that was a I, Kelsey laid out the issues really well. I thought I would actually look at this problem from the same issue in Tehran. So, you know, we have a new Iranian president that's going to be in office. And there was a little bit of a, a question mark over you know, what will happen to the dur durability of any agreement if, you know, maybe the new Iranian president is less committed uh, to sticking with the JCPOA. And similarly, from the Iranian standpoint, you know, this is not uh, seen as a treaty. And so the Iranian parliament, which like Congress has a lot of strong views about this nuclear deal, um, you know, might create some, some hurdles. But I think the way in which Iranian presidential candidates have um, sort of uh, talked about this issue is instructive to, at a minimum, what we need to see in Washington. And what's interesting is that Iranian political candidates from across the spectrum, um, so hardline candidates who are nominally from a political bloc that's been more vocal about the problems with the nuclear deal, have made clear in the run up to the election that they will abide by the deal and respect it because it is part of the sort of state level commitment of Iran um, as part as a member of the international community. And so this sort of suggests to me that, you know, even if the deal doesn't have a legal identity as a treaty, as something that's been ratified by Congress, I think at a minimum, what we need to see is uh, the idea that uh, presidents, um, whether in Washington or in Tehran, respect uh, the uh, sort of policies put in place by their predecessors that reflect a kind of um, state commitment to some sort of uh, diplomatic or strategic understanding with um, the, the rest of the international community. So, the reason I raised this uh, and sort of want to talk about it from this perspective is that, you know, in some ways, I think Trump was an aberration. You know, it is true that uh, there was some risk of this problem when the Obama administration was unable to sort of make this something that Congress fully gave its stamp of approval uh, on. But uh, they could not necessarily have foreseen that a president would come into office who would, for example, ignore uh, the intelligence assessments. Uh, of the US intelligence community in making a decision to leave an agreement like that. So I think that's sort of where we are is that, you know, of course, we're encumbered by um, this difficult relationship between the executive and the, and the legislature in, in Washington um, when it comes to these kinds of agreements. But at a minimum, what we need to just see is if a sort of rational approach to US foreign policy prevails, 
then the deal should be relatively durable. And I think that rationale uh, is what will mean that uh, in Iran for the next president, they will stay committed to this deal. Uh, and you know that gives us a good runway of about uh, the next uh, better part of four years while Biden is in office to consolidate it. A lot coming on the horizon shortly. Um, let's switch out of American politics and look towards all of the activity in the Middle East right now. Around the support of Hamas is seen as a tactic to destabilize Israel's newfound normalized relations with several Arab states in the Middle East, and it helps bolster Iran's status as a regional power. Is this fighting between Israel and Hamas in recent weeks impacting the future of the nuclear deal? How and why? Or why not? Kelsey? You know, I think that the negotiators in Vienna have shown remarkable focus and remarkable kind of dedication to staying on task to restoring the deal. I mean, not only does the, you know, has, has the activity between Israel and Hamas, um, you know, not impacted the, the, the talks in Vienna, uh, but also, you know, the act of sabotage against Iran's Natanz site. Uh, that didn't really, you know, deter or, or sort of cause Iranian negotiators to change course in Vienna as well. Uh, so I think that they are sort of remarkably, you know, remarkably focused. Uh, to me, though, you know, what, you know, the, you know, Hamas's capacity when it comes to, you know, in, indigenizing, you know, rockets, um, you know, there is evidence that, you know, that, that Iran has supplied, supplied, you know, technical support on the missile of the, the front to, to, to Hamas in the past. I mean, to me, what this really underscores is the imperative of beginning, you know, a regional security dialogue that brings together actors in the region uh, to have you know, more serious discussions about these issues. Uh, and, and I think that you know, these initial indications we've seen about you know, Iranian Saudi meetings, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you know, could be a step you know, in that direction you know, towards engaging in regional security you know, in a process that's led by actors in the region. Um, relatedly, though, you know, I do think that, you know, there are some steps that the United States can take to address the very real missile proliferation issues um, that we've seen, you know, that are systemic issues, you know, in, in the Middle East. I mean, evidence of Iran supplying missiles um, to the Houthis, you know, for one, you know, um, equip military equipment to Hezbollah and Hamas. I mean, that is very troubling and it does need to be addressed. And I think not only can we address that in future follow up talks, but the United States can do more to work with countries in the region in terms of intelligence sharing to interdict and disrupt those supply lines. And I think all of that could happen you know, in parallel you know, to this diplomatic front that's designed to bring regional players together to really get at the root causes of some of these security conflicts. So what I would add to that is just that I think the regional dimension is the one way in which we're actually in a much better position than we were back in 2015 or 2016. And the reason I say that is that we have a little bit of a, an aha moment um, in different uh, capitals uh, in the region, uh, primarily in Abu Dhabi, uh, in the UAE, and also in Riyadh, uh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, where uh, countries that were sort of uh, threatened by the idea that the nuclear deal and normalization of relations with Iran would uh, sort of tip the balance of power in Iran's favor in the region, um, are no longer thinking about their regional rivalry with Iran in quite the same sort of zero sum terms. And so what we have had is after the very kind of uh, the brutal uh, sort of experience of the conflict in Yemen, uh, the instability related to Iranian escalation after the U.S. withdrawal on the nuclear deal that saw uh, mines planted on commercial ships in the Persian Gulf. It saw drone attacks on oil infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. It saw all sorts of, you know, sort of um, uh, hidden conflict that we, you know, only see glimpse of, glimpses of uh, by intelligence agencies and sort of different actors in the region. I think we're at an interesting point where um, in 2019, uh, diplomatic dialogue began again between the UAE and Iran to de-escalate some of their uh, uh, challenges. And we have seen most recently, and perhaps most surprisingly, 
uh, a new track of dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia that's been taking place in meetings that were for a while secret uh, in Baghdad between intelligence officials from both countries. And so what this suggests is that the regional powers, you know, Iran, Saudi Arabia, UAE, are coming to the realization that it is not in anyone's interest to be at each other's throats um, and that they can't afford that, frankly, after uh, a very expensive um, and a, a sort of a humanitarian um, crisis that has uh, emerged across the region because of the fighting um, indirect and direct over the last sort of handful of years. So this is very different from the landscape where uh, the Obama administration was trying to uh, push through a deal with Iran that they really didn't have that much buy-in from, uh, from the UAE, from Saudi Arabia, and certainly not from Israel. This time around, I think you have um, uh, positive public statements and certainly, I think, a, a green light behind closed doors from the UAE and Saudi Arabia that the US uh, you know, should re-enter this agreement and it's in everyone's interest. And I would argue that you know, there is and as there was in 2016, in, in most of the sort of um, in the uh, Israeli intelligence community and some of the more sort of uh, strategic parts of that leadership, there was an understanding that the nuclear deal wasn't Israel's interest. If there's a change of leadership in Israel, then I would anticipate that some of that more vociferous public opposition towards the deal would also subside. So that, from that standpoint, I think the deal is actually on firmer footing. And if the U.S. re-enters, um, it makes it easier to then say, OK, one of the ways we can build on the deal is let's think about regional security and maybe we can foster a multilateral dialogue between Iran and uh, its neighbors um, and kind of leave it to them to figure out their own security problems. It's not something that, you know, at this stage with the U.S. wanting to disengage, I think rightly from the Middle East a little bit. Um, you know, it's time that we create a space and a platform for the local players to sort out their differences rather than trying to engineer some balance between these actors um, and thinking that uh, that zero sum approach can't be over overcome. Interesting. We have a tremendous amount of questions coming in from our audience, and I want to make sure we get to those. They're challenging. You'll enjoy them. Um, but as is tradition here, we always like to start with a question from a student who's tracking these issues from a very young age, and maybe will be one day sitting in your chairs or negotiators' chairs to help solve them. Today, we've got Gabrielle Valencia with us, a graduating senior at Conestoga High School, attending Northeastern University in the fall. She interns with us here at the World Affairs Council and has a passion for all things world affairs. Gabrielle, your question, please. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you in the World Affairs Council for providing me with this opportunity. I'm incredibly excited. Um, and thank you, Yara and Kelsey. You guys have been so well-spoken and um, very insightful so far, and I have so much to learn from both of you. My question is, how will the success or failure of current negotiations impact future diplomacy between the United States and Iran? Yeah, you want to take that one? Sure. Okay. Um, thank you, Gabrielle. That's a that's a really good question because I think it's easy to talk about the sort of nitty gritty of what's about to happen, but you know the answer to that question is that I think the U.S. needs to develop a vision for what it wants uh, to where it wants to end up with regards to its relations with Iran. We have had. Uh, a pretty dismal 40 years of um, misunderstanding and misapprehensions on both sides of the US-Iran relationship. And essentially all it has done is complicate um, the regional landscape. I think it has uh, had enormous um, negative impacts on the Iranian people and on, uh, you know, to a lesser extent, obviously the American people, but certainly uh, the large Iranian diaspora community that's in the United States. And so I think what we, what I would hope is that if we can cross this hurdle of the US re-entering the agreement, um, you know, to use the sort of phrase Kelsey used, it creates some space to start thinking about uh, that bigger vision for where relations can go. And I think there are a lot of people in Washington who are inherently skeptical that we could have any kind of 
constructive diplomatic relationship with Iran so long as it is an Islamic Republic. But to kind of give one example of where we may end up is um, I often think about a parallel uh, to Vietnam, which seems like a very different case. But in some ways, it's more surprising that the US has a a very healthy uh, working relationship with Vietnam, a country in which uh, it lost a war in which uh, tens of thousands of US soldiers died. Um, and yet today, although you know, the Vietnam is still nominally a communist uh, country, although it has taken steps to liberalize, we have that productive relationship. And I think that shows that even when there's a really dark period in the history of a relationship between two countries, if there's a vision and a long-term commitment to work on rebuilding trust, um, uh, particularly through people-to-people -people exchanges, we can get there. Um, it is disappointing to me that that kind of political vision has never really been applied to the case of Iran, but it's high time. And you know, I do think that it might be the right moment given the larger conversation that is taking place uh, in the US about what US Middle East policy should look like generally. Yeah, if I could just jump in on that. And um, thanks for such a great question, Gabrielle, and congratulations on your upcoming graduation and uh, best of luck as you start college in the fall. And I hope that goes well. Um, I want to take a, a perhaps a, a darker approach to the question. I mean, I think you are very well laid out, you know, the opportunity to create a vision for the US relationship with Iran if these negotiations go well. But, but I want to talk a little bit about the consequences of failure. I mean, if these negotiations fail to restore the nuclear deal, I think we're going to see Iran continue to ratchet up its nuclear activities. And as it does that, as it gains you know, new capabilities and new knowledge that it didn't have when we were negotiating with Iran you know, to get that deal in 2015, you know, all of those capabilities are going to be issues that the United States and the international community are going to have to contend with you know, in you know, a new round of negotiations. So on the nuclear side, the talks only get more complicated if we have to start from square one. And then you compound that with the fact that the United States has suffered you know, a, a credibility blow uh, because of Trump's approach to, to Iran policy. Uh, and the United States may not be able to generate the same level of international support for its sanctions regime designed to, you know, to push Iran back to the negotiating table. So you have you know, Iran increasing its leverage on the nuclear side, you know, but the United States not necessarily being able to obtain the same amount of leverage and international support that it had in the, the lead up to that 2015 deal. Uh, so again, I, I think you know, it, it, it risks creating a situation where the United States is, is, is going to be less successful, unfortunately, in, in, in future talks. Um, I also think that there's a regional component that you know we shouldn't forget here. I mean, it's it's very common to sort of look at Iran's nuclear program, you know, in a vacuum. But the nuclear landscape in the Middle East has changed considerably, you know, now as opposed to 2015 when the deal was finalized. We've seen Saudi Arabia make some very concerning statements threatening to match Iran's nuclear capabilities and pursue nuclear weapons if the JCPOA collapses. We've seen similar, you know, very disturbing rhetoric, you know, from Turkey. You know, we're also seeing a time in this region when, you know, chemical weapons use is, is going almost unanswered in terms of international consequences and accountability. Uh, so again, I, I think we're, we risk creating a landscape in which you know, more countries are seeking to obtain that nuclear hedging capability, which provides further instability and again, increases the risk of nuclear proliferation across the region writ large. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry to take kind of the, the darker, you know, what happens if we fail side, but I think that's important to keep in mind, because again, I think the United States, you know, won't have as strong of a hand going into future negotiations, you know, whereas Iran will have been able to strengthen its hand. Thank you very much, Gabrielle, and to Kelsey and Yar for your answers. We have another question from the audience that's almost a flip of this about um, what is the big picture for Iran? Larry Holman asks, what problem is Iran trying to solve by becoming a nuclear nation? And could the US and other nations help them solve that problem without becoming a nuclear nation? What is their goal? And is there another way to help Iran achieve that goal that doesn't involve nuclear success? And would that alternative be less expensive over time? 
then this process and whatever it may entail of watching Iran uh, attain nuclear power. Kelsey? Yeah, I think that's a great question because, you know, so often, you know, we talk about Iran's nuclear program, you know, without thinking about what drove Iran to consider nuclear weapons uh, and the decision making in Tehran that's gone into, you know, deciding to pursue and then, you know, abandon it, its nuclear program. Uh, and I think, you know, looking back to some of the original motivations behind Iran's nuclear weapons program, you know, which, which ended in 2003, you know, a lot of this had to do with, with regional security dynamics. I mean, we can't forget that, you know, Iran was subject to horrific chemical weapons attacks during the Iran-Iraq war, and the international community was largely silent in the face of those attacks. So I think, you know, some of those experiences, you know, raise this idea in Tehran that having a nuclear deterrent would protect Iran's territorial integrity, you know, going forward in, in, in future conflicts. And, you know, around 2003, uh, that decision making really began to change. And I think the costs of pursuing an illicit nuclear weapons program, you know, begin to to exceed the perceived security gains. So I think going forward to ensure that Iran does not decide to pursue nuclear weapons down the road, you know, we have to think about that cost benefit analysis. And that's why I think you know, the regional security component that's come up that's been mentioned in the past you know, is so critical because if Iran doesn't see a security need to, uh, that drives it to pursue nuclear weapons, uh, then it really has no incentive to do so because it's going to incur some pretty horrific costs in terms of sanctions, international condemnation and isolation, you know, if it decides to go down that path. So I think, you know, regional security is important. You know, another point that I would that I would drive home is that, you know, we've seen, you know, over the past several decades, you know, attempts to sort of interfere with Iran's nuclear program, sometimes using cyber, you know, Stuxnet, Olympic Games, for instance, you know, were designed to slow Iran's program. Uh, more recently, you know, we saw the, uh, the assassination of a prominent Iranian scientist and this act of sabotage against Iran's facility. All of these, I think, are counterproductive. They might set Iran's program back temporarily, uh, but, you know, in the end, you know, what these attacks essentially message to Iran is that it may be a better idea to pursue nuclear weapons to try to deter further acts of aggression. Uh, so again, you know, I think these attacks can be counterproductive in the long term when thinking about that influence on Iran's cost benefit analysis. And that's why I think diplomacy is so important, uh, because we can't eliminate the knowledge that Iran has about nuclear weapons, you know, by attacking its facilities, you know, we can't put that genie back in the bottle. Uh, so if we demonstrate to Iran that there are benefits towards engaging diplomatically and limiting its program and addressing those security concerns that might drive an interest in nuclear weapons in the future, I think that is how in the long term, you know, we ensure that um, the costs of pursuing nuclear weapons, you know, really outweigh the benefits in Iran's calculus. Yeah, reaction. Yeah, so I mean, I I um, very much agree with how Kelsey has sort of laid this out, and I also agree it's an it's a really nice way of framing the problem, and so it's a great question. Um, I think you know Iran's nuclear program has become quite symbolic um, with regards to sort of larger issues around where Iran wants to be in the international system and how, whether or not it is allowed to sort of uh, take that place uh, by powers, uh, primarily by the US. You know, Iran is a, when I talk about this problem with Iranian uh, stakeholders, you know, what they point out is that they are pretty uncommitted nuclear proliferators. Um, they, you know, abandon the serious work on a weapons program um, more than uh, 15 years ago. And they have maintained a nuclear program that is um, largely civilian in nature. And the concern of the international community is around activities that are part of that program that could furnish proliferation of a nuclear weapon um, you know, at some point if Iran decides to seriously pursue it. But even prior to the nuclear deal, you know, Iran has been a signatory of the non-proliferation treaty. And from a strategic standpoint, uh, as Kelsey has described, you know, Iran is not interested in acquiring a nuclear weapon for Saudi Arabia to then also acquire a nuclear weapon. So you don't want to, you know, the Iranians have looked at the Pakistan-India situation and realized that it's not entirely clear that either country benefited all that much by achieving this 
um, nuclear deterrent uh, when their main rivalry is a regional one. So the question of like, what can we sort of work with Iran to create that takes away the symbolic importance of the nuclear program and the security risks that emanate from Iran's maintenance of a large nuclear program that um, when not subject to inspections makes everyone nervous. And I think a lot of it actually comes down to this idea of legitimacy and prestige. Um, Iran, uh, you know, is one of these countries that is, uh, it's a sort of uh, middle power. It's economically quite successful, but it's not a standout uh, sort of star of the global economy. It's politically quite influential, but it's also isolated because of uh, it being in the Middle East and because of its problems with the US. Um, and for both of those reasons, I think Iran feels that it is not afforded sufficient weight in the international system. And one of the ways that it's been able to kind of address that perceived um, lack of uh, respect and, and consideration is by essentially making itself the subject of an ongoing diplomatic crisis. And so what we want to offer Iran is an, a pathway to a situation where Iran can be influential and can have uh, engagement with world powers without having to induce a kind of crisis in order to have that influence. Um, and so if you think about, you know, we talked about the role of Europe and Russia and China and the bilateral relationships, you know, frankly, we're in a situation where foreign ministers travel to Iran when there's something wrong now that needs to be fixed. And we kind of want to open the door to a situation where foreign ministers and economic ministers can travel to Iran because they're building something productive. And so I think, you know, this is why the multilateral diplomacy and U.S. commitment to it is so important. And it goes back to um, sort of Gabrielle's question about, uh, you know, where, why we need a vision. Um, and if we can offer Iran the opportunity to, and I think Iran would have to address other aspects of its activities. So like the regional dimension, some of its support for um, organizations that the United States considers terrorist groups, but those are all workable things. And if they can be worked on in a collaborative format, then Iran will be gaining some of that prestige that uh, I think it, Iranian stakeholders feel they deserve given the sort of generally the size of the country and, and the weight of the country. And you all have both given us a lot to think about and stretched this issue beyond sanctions and you know what Congress will do or won't do in the Biden administration, which is often what we hear, of course, in the news in the US. And there's a much more complex story here with international relations among other countries and, and this, these visioning ideas. What is what does Iran want and what do we want from Iran? We're not talking about that. And I'm so grateful that we could explore those, albeit briefly tonight. We are rounding out the hour. So unfortunately we've got some questions that remain unanswered, but leave that as a sign that people are very curious about this topic and, and appreciate your insights and expertise. I wanna thank you both Yar and Kelsey for joining us tonight. And of course, thanks to our audience and our members of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia who spent this hour with us learning a bit more about a topic that is really critical in so many different ways. And thank you to the Iran Project who helped us put together tonight's program and this excellent content. We encourage you all to enjoy the council's other programs that are upcoming, which are all listed on our website. We're exploring topics such as Chile's contributions to the food and innovation technology around the world, the impact of the Arab Spring 10 years later, and of course, the US's relationship with China. Stay tuned for more program announcements coming up, which are all on our website at wacphila.org. We do hope that you'll join us. Thanks again for your time and audience and attention tonight and to our speakers, Kelsey and Yar. Have a wonder, wonderful evening. Good night.